My name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here. GMAT review, the official guide, the 13th edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. The book contains 230 problem solving questions. It has 174 data sufficiency questions. We have already solved every single math problem from this book. If you're interested in watching the original solutions to any, of, any one of these problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. Right now we are in the process of redoing the problems and we are on page number 290. Please turn to it, page number 290. The very first problem that you see there on the page, number 155. Let's see what it has to say. Problem number 155 on page number 290. We are given, we are given a triangle here. And we are told that OP is smaller than PQ. Alright, so OP is smaller, here is our OP, which, which as you can clearly see, O to P, as you can see, is smaller than P to Q. And the question simply is, is the area, is the area of this triangle, OPQ, OPQ, is the area of this triangle less than 48? Very simple, very straightforward question. Let's see what they tell us. In statement, in, in statement one, in statement one, they're telling us that the coordinates coordinates of point P are 6 and 8. So here's our point P. The coordinates we are told is 6 are 6 and 8. Well, if if the coordinates of this point point P are 6 and 8, that means that this distance from O to, let's give it a name here, let's call it R here, that would imply that O to R, O to R has to be 6. This implies that O to R has to be 6. It's also in turn implies, because of the fact that we are told that O P, O to P is smaller than, this distance O to P we are told is smaller than P to Q. If this distance is longer and if O to R is 6, this also implies, and it also implies, that this distance R to R to Q, we do not know what the distance is, but whatever the distance is, because of the fact that this is 6, this would have to be more than 6, because this distance P to Q is longer than, the, than O to P. This also implies that R to Q would have to equal to something more than 6. This is how we write something more than 6, 6 with a small plus sign on top of it because because we are told that OP is smaller than PQ. Are you with me so far? Let's see what we can do with that information. Now question here is is the area of this triangle less than 48? How does one find the area of a triangle? Area of a triangle is one half base times side. Let's see what we can do. The area of triangle OPQ is what we are interested in which is one half base, which is from O to Q, one half base times height, O to Q, O to Q, this is 6, and this is something more than 6. Well, if O to R is 6 and, and R to Q is something more than 6, then O to Q, which is the base of the triangle, would have to be something more than 12. This is how we write something more than 12. 12 with a tiny plus sign on top. How much is the height of this triangle? Well, the height is right here. This is the height, 8. The height of this triangle is uh, P to R, which is the Y coordinate, 8. We have a 2 on the bottom, we have 8 there. Let's cross, cross, cancel them out, we get 4. So it's 4 times something more than 12. 4 times something more than 12 would have to be more than 48. 4 times four times something more than 12. Four times 12 is 48, therefore four times something more than 12, whatever that happens to be. 
this is where the plus pop this is this distance is more than six it doesn't matter whether this distance is 6.001 or whether this distance is six million feet if this is six feet this is more than six feet and that's all it matters and therefore this distance from here to here is two more than 12 feet that's what this is something more than 12 times 4 would have to be something more than 48 are we able to answer the question that is being asked do we have sufficient data for us to be able to answer the question the question was is the area of the triangle less than 48 the answer is no the area of the triangle is not less than 48 or they're looking for less than 48 or more than 48 it really doesn't matter or they're looking for greater than 48 is the area greater than 48 it doesn't matter it really doesn't matter at all okay i'm going to leave it the way it is just for just to make a point here even if they were asking us is the area is the area of the triangle less than 48 are we able to answer that question is it is the area less than 48 are we able to answer the question the answer is yes we are able to give a definitive answer and our answer would be no it is not less than 48 it is more than 48 since we are able to give a definitive answer it doesn't matter whether the answer is affirmative or negative since we are able to give a definitive answer first let me does the job a d b c e a d b c e now that we established the first statement by itself is enough, we know now, answer cannot be B, C, or E. It would have to be either A or D. Do you understand? The reason I left it like this is because I want you to understand, as I always tell, remind you, as I always tell you, that the point here is not that the answer was yes. If, if, we, were to, if, if we were to change this to, is the area of the triangle greater than 48, then our, then our answer would be, yes, it is greater than 48. We just saw it. It is greater than 48. In that case, the answer would be yes. But that's not the point. The point here is not that the answer is yes. The point is we are able to give an answer either a yes or a no. So if the question was, is the area of the triangle less than 48? Our answer in that case would be no, it is not less than 48. It is in fact more than 48. Even though the answer is no, this statement still is sufficient. The, the, the information in the first statement is still sufficient because it enables us to give an answer, a yes or a no. Let's look at second statement. That's it, we're done with the first statement. Let's look at second statement. Just give me one brief second. Let's see what they tell us in the second statement. So when we go to second statement, everything has to go. Everything that we got from the first statement has to go. All of this has to go. Everything has to go from the first statement. None of this implies. No, no, none of that applies. This is what we're dealing with. Now, in the, first, in the second statement, they tell us, in the second statement, they tell us that the coordinates of point Q are 13 and 0. They tell us that the coordinates of point Q are 13 and 0. Again, we find the area of the triangle just like we always do, which is the area of the triangle OPQ would be 1 half base times height. Now 1 half, the base we are told is 13. Right here we are told this is 13. So the base is 13. The question is, what about the height? The second statement provides us no information at all for us to ascertain the height. And without knowing how high the triangle is, we cannot figure out the we cannot figure out the area of the triangle, and therefore we cannot answer this question. We have no idea what the area of the triangle is going to be. We cannot tell, we can we are not able to tell whether the area of the triangle is going to be less than 48 or more than 48. Who knows? It depends on the height. If the height turns out to be uh, well, you get the idea. Let's not let's not beat it to that. The second statement does not do the job because of the fact that the second statement does not do the job. The answer is A. The answer is A. Let's go to the next one, shall we? Number one hundred and fifty-six. Number one hundred and fifty-six. Once in a while, of course, we run into a question which is very involved and very difficult. But a lot of the time, these questions actually go very fast because we have very little to do here. We don't actually have to do anything. We just have to be able to answer the question, do we have sufficient data? Yes or no? 156. In 156, we are told that x times n does not equal 0. And there is a reason for it. Whenever they go out of their way to tell you that x times n does not equal to 0, or a does not equal to 0, or y does not equal to uh, y does not equal to 0, well, you know, somewhere in the, in the calculation, we're going to have to divide some quantity by a or y or x times n. And you cannot divide anything by 0, because if you divide something by 0, then, of course, the whole thing explodes. It becomes infinite. To, to obviate that, uh, that, uh, that uh, complication, 
they tell you that it does not equal to zero. To obviate that complication, the potential uh, of a denominator, or potential of having the de potential of denominator being being a zero, they tell you that it is not equal to zero. They they obviate that complication. Do you understand? They take it out. They make it unnecessary. They they eliminate it. They get rid of it. The complication of uh, of uh, the bottom being zero. Obviate is something that we learned on day number fifty two. Just type in GMAT vocabulary words, day number 52, and you will learn that word along with some other words. Let's see what they tell us. The question simply is how much is S? They want to know how much S is. And they tell us that S equals to 2 over N over 1 plus X plus 2 over 3X. And the question is how much is, how much is S? Tell you what, whenever they give us something like this, whenever they give us something like this, it's always a good idea to simplify the bloody thing as much as you can before you worry about looking at the two statements. If you have this thing in the simplest form possible, it will make our life easier down the road. So let's do that, shall we? We're going to simplify this thing. Why don't you do it yourself? Simplify yours. Pause the video if you have to and simplify it on your own, okay? So let's do the bottom first. The common denominator here would be 3. So if you multiply the top and bottom by 3, here we'll end up with 3x and on the top we'll end up with 3. So we have a common denominator of 3x and 3 times 1 is 3 plus 2. Oh really, that's, that's, that's how simple it is, apparently. And on the top we have 2 over n. So I'm going to write that 3 plus 2 as a 5. As a 5. And of course we know what to do when we have, when we have one fraction being divided by another fraction. So what do we do? We take the top fraction, we take the top fraction, which is 2 over n, 2 over n, and we multiply it, and we multiply the top fraction by the reciprocal of the bottom fraction. The reciprocal of the bottom fraction would be 3x over 5. 2 times 3 is 6, so we end up with 6 over 5, 6 over 5, times x over n. That's what s is. Okay, keep that in mind. That's what S is. And the question is, how much is that quantity? As you can clearly see, in order for us to ascertain the value of the S, we need to know how much X is and we need to know how much N is. Let's see what they tell us. In the first statement, they tell us, in the first statement, they tell us that X equals 2N. Well, X equals 2N. Let's put it in there. That's our S here. S equals 6 over 5 times X over N x we know is 2n. It's x over n which we know x we know is 2n. They're telling us that the x equals 2n. So we substitute in here 2n and on the bottom we have n. n drops out and we can figure out the value of s. s will be 6 times 2 which is 12 over 5. Of course all of this was unnecessary. All of this was unnecessary work. You just had to be able to see immediately that if x equals 2n you put 2n in there and n is going to drop out and that's the end of the story. We don't actually have to do everything out, you understand, in the real exam. The first statement does the job quite nicely. The first statement does the job quite beautifully. A, D, B, C, E. Now that we established that the first statement by itself is enough, we know now that the answer cannot be B, C, or E. It would have to be either A or D. Let's look at second statement, shall we? Second statement goes on to tell us that... Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us that n equals half. Do you see a problem already? Do you see a problem already? In the real exam, had it been a real exam, we would not do any work at all. Everything that we are about to do would be a sheer waste of time in the real exam. That's it. You can stop right here. This, this is not enough. You put n equal to half in there. What about the bloody x? Bloody or not, it's going to pose a problem. We need to know what the bloody thing is. We have no idea at all how much x is. What's the point of putting in half in there? Without the x, we cannot figure out the s. That's it, then the story. The second statement by itself is not enough. Second statement by itself does not do the job. Answer to this problem is a. But just 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 for the purpose of learning, let's put it in, we'll show it here. S equals to 6 over 5 times x over n. 
which we know is half. This is everything is known, but what about the x? Since we do not know the value of x, we cannot figure out the value of s. We need to know the value of x. And the second statement provides us no information at all what x is or how it compares to n. We need to know one or the other. And therefore the answer is a. Let's go on to the next one, number 157. 157. Number 157. We are told that n is a positive integer. n is a positive integer. So it has to be a whole number, it has to be positive. We are also told that k equals to 5 point of oh, blast it. 5.1 times 10 raised to n. And the question simply is how much is k? How much is k? Let's see what they tell us. Again, look, in order for us to ascertain the value of k, in order for us to know what k equals to, we have to know how much n is. We have to know something about n. We have to know the exact value of the n as a matter of fact, in order for us to give, in order for us to be able to give a unique value of k. Let's see what they tell us. Statement 1 tells us that k happens to be something between 6,000 and half a million. K has to be something between 6,000 and half a million. Let's see what happens, shall we? Let's see what happens. Keep in mind that this power that we have here, the exponents that we have here, has to be positive and has to be a whole number. Well, if it has to be a positive whole number, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're just going to plug in numbers and see what happens. Let's plug in n equal to 1. K is 5.1 times 10 raised to n, let's pretend n is 1. Well, if n, uh, n is 1, then it's 5.1 times 10, that's just 51, and that's not going to work, because we are told that k lies somewhere between 6,000 and half a million, which means n cannot be, n cannot be, n can not be 1. Can it be 2? Can it be 2? The answer is no, because 10 raised to 2 is 100 for times 5.1 is just going to be 510. We are told that k lies somewhere between 6,000 and half a million. n cannot be 2. Can it be 3? Well, let's, let's find out. Can it be 3? Had it been 3, you will just stick one more zero. Again, that's not going to work, because k has to be between 6,000 and half a million. n cannot be, n cannot be 3. Can it be 4? Can n be 4? And you see, I should have written this so close here, because let's, let's put it here. If n is equal to 4, then this will be 51,000. Is it possible for k to be 51,000? The answer is, why not? 51,000 would work, because 51,000 falls between 6,000 and half a million. It is possible for n to be 4. n may be 4. N Maybe four. That is possible. That is possible. Can it be five? Watch what happens. Can it be five? If n is equal to five, then ten raised to five times five point one will end up with five hundred and ten thousand. Is it possible for k to be five hundred and ten thousand? The answer is no. It is not possible because it has to be less than half a million. It cannot be five. It cannot be anything more than five. It cannot be one, two, or three, because they are too small. It cannot be, it cannot, n cannot be more than five. N cannot be, n can not be five or more. Well, if it cannot be five or more, and one, two, and three are too small, those positive integers too small, it's not allowed to be one, two, or three, and it cannot be more than five, the bloody thing, the bloody thing would have to be four. Because it has to be a whole number, it has to be a positive number. The only positive whole number that is left is 4. n must be 4. So this implies that n must be 4. n must be 4. And if n is 4, if n is 4, then 
this exactly what we just found. The question was, how much the, what's the value of k? The answer is k is equal to 51,000. Are we able to answer that question? The question, answer is yes. Again, this part was not necessary. This is all we have to realize that n must be 4. As long as n is equal to 4, it doesn't matter what it works out to be. We know for a fact that n is 4, so whatever that value happens to be, that's what the value of the k is. The first statement by, by itself does the job quite beautifully. The first statement does the job quite beautifully. Where can we stick it? A, D, B, C, E. A, D, B, C, E. Now that we established that the first statement by itself is enough, we know now, answer cannot be B, C, or E. It will have to be either A or D. Let's look at the second statement. The second statement, I warn you, is damn silly. It's beyond damn silly, it's just retarded. I don't know why it is even there. They tell you that K squared is equal to 2.601 times 10 raised to 9. What the hell? If I tell you, if I tell you that n squared is equal to 9, are you able to tell me what n is equal to? Of course we are. Take the square of both sides. That's exactly what we have to do here. The question is how much is k? Can we answer that question based on what is given in the second statement? The answer is yes, because we know the value of k squared. If we know the value of the k squared, k is simply the square root of the whole quantity. That's it. Second statement does the job quite beautifully also. The answer is D. Answer to this question is D. That's it, we are done. Now as far as the exam is concerned, we are done. As far as the exam is concerned, we are done with this problem. But we're going to finish up solving it just for learning purposes, as we always do. But not something that we'll do in the real exam. Do you understand? It'll be foolish. Let's finish it up. I'm curious. So, what can we do here? Well, we can write this 2.601. 10 raised to 9 as 10 raised to 3 times 10 raised to 6. Watch what happens. We want the square root of this quantity. 10 raised to 9 can be written as 10 raised to 3 times 10 raised to 6. Now, 2.601 times 1000, which is what the 10 raised to 3 is. We're going to move the decimal place to 3 places. It will be 1, 2, 3. It becomes 2601. It becomes 2601. It becomes... 2601 times 10 raised to 6. Well, square root of 10 raised to 6 is very simple. The square root of 10 raised to 6 is very simple. The square root of 10 raised to 6 is simply, it's just 6 over 2, which is 10 raised to 3. What's the square root of 2601? What the hell do I know? We do know, however, we do know, however, that 5 times 5 is 25. That I do know. I'm very proud of it, too. Do you understand? I do know that 5 times 5 is 25 and therefore 50 times 50 must be 2500. This thing is 2601. Let's try 51, shall we? Let's try 51. 51 has to be the 51 has to be the answer because had it been 52, the unit digit would have been 4. Had it been 53, the unit digit would have been 9. To say nothing of the fact that 52 and 53 are going to be too large. Let's try 51 and see what happens. 51 times 51, 51 times 51, 1 times 51 is just 51, 5 times 1 is 5, and 5 times 5 is 25, and we get 1, 5 plus 5 is 0, 5 plus 5 is 10, 6, you see? So the square root of, the square root of 2601 is actually 51. 51 times 10 raised to 3 is what we find. 51 times 10 raised to 3 which is exactly 51,000. Wouldn't you know it? Wouldn't you know it? That's exactly what we found the k to be from the work that we did in the first statement. As I always remind you, as I always pointed out to you, the two statements never contradict each other. They never give us different answer. If they do, if we do arrive at diff two different values of k from the, two, from the work that you do in the two statements, if we arrive at two different answers, then something has gone wrong drastically. Something has gone wrong either in the work that you did in the first statement or the work that you did in the second statement or of course there is a third possibility that both the works that you did in the first statement and second statement they are both wrong. They cannot both be correct. They, they do not contradict each other. If the first statement told us that k was equal to 51,000 and you do the work in the second statement and you find out that k is equal to all of a sudden 52,000 something has gone wrong. As you can see we found the same answer as before. K is equal to 51,000. That was the end of the sermon. Amen. 
I shall see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.